You're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. In fact, you are listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeedy do. It is that one that brings you right to the firehouse kitchen table. We got a little uh, little offshoot tonight, a little change of pace, maybe, if you will. Right, Pete? Oh, change totally. Of pace. Totally. Uh, let, let, you know, let us not think that firemen are the center of the universe, even though we do think that we are the center of the universe. There are other first responders out there who do it day in and day out. And we're going to get that perspective tonight. This guy's done it. He was doing it, Stephen. Before I was, before <laughs> me and Ruffy were born, he was doing it. I'm not happy with this guy. Why? Uh, He's overdressed. I just, uh, <laughs> I have to say, like, I came on, like, you you know, when we said we were going to have an ESU guy, a bomb squad guy, I was kind of prepared to, you know. Oh, you ready balls. to go. You ready to duke it yeah. up a little bit. But he's now I see it. The guy, the guy shows up. He looks like an absolute gentleman. He's just, <laughs> I, it's just going to, he's too nice of a guy already. I could tell yeah. already. It's, I, I like him already. So it's no good. Well, it doesn't mean he doesn't have an interesting career. I could tell you that. Maybe no, I'm could... saying, of course he's going to have, I mean, just the stuff that he's got and the thing, his whole oh. Maybe we, uh, can resume. Bring the, uh, maybe we can bring the cop out in them. I don't know. Maybe we can, <laughs> you know. I don't know. We could get it out of him. I'll get it out of him. Don't <laughs> worry. We'll, we'll bring it out of him. We'll bring don't it out of him. You. What he's does he look lot. like in the back there, Peter? Is he he's smirking? Or is he... he's, 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 I think he's laughing. You know, I, I, He's laughing at you two knuckleheads. This guy's already... He's, he's, you know. He is legit. And I got to uh, say, I got to thank uh, MC. Mikey Mike's in there. He got us this guest. Yeah, uh, yeah. Definitely check out MC's yeah. uh, podcast over yeah. here on... Uh, on uh, YouTube as well, guys. Give the man, give the man a follow. You know if this, if this doesn't go the way we want, Ruffy, I got another guy from Truck Ten. I think he'll be definitely. We can definitely get it out of him. We can get him uh, aggravated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nice. And we don't want to aggravate this guy. I can like, first of all, hold on. I get him pissed off. I We're not it. aggravating <laughs> any of our guests. That's not what the goal of the show is. Yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. Come on, man. That's the only Come guy on, I would, man. I would, I would try to aggravate. You know. Yeah. I like when he gets angry and he's like, "Come on, man! Come you know? on, man! I love it." I wrote, see, I wrote down some shit. With, oh, there it is, man. This guy got on in June of ninety of uh, ninety six of nineteen sixty eight. Roof. I was only wow. uh, a couple of days old. I you weren't even born yet. Couple you months, still, September. You were still in the womb. <laughs> <laughs> the womb. <laughs> the womb is right. polluted. All Your right. womb is polluted. You're so polluted so, with that polluted. stuff. Right, no you can't right. even make a little baby. All right. Uh, what are we looking at? We are uh, looking at a couple quick ads, guys. The uh, the usual deal. GettingSaltyApparel.com. That's how we pay the bills <clears throat> around here. Cool T-shirts, cool hats, cool hoodies, firefighter apparel mm -hmm. and accessories. We've been doing it a long time, Stephen. Doing it, Stephen. Uh, and uh, you might have seen us at the trade shows, but you can find us at the web. GettingSaltyApparel.com. Uh, where you find the best firefighter apparel and accessories in the game. Also, guys, don't be uh, don't be too shy. If you're watching this live, hit us up in the super chat. We would uh, really appreciate it. You guys are our number one uh, syndicators and our number one sponsors, so we need you. Hit us up. And if you are watching this after the fact, hit us up in the super thanks. Same thing as the super chat. Same shout out to all you guys for uh, and, and and a big thanks for supporting the show. And that's it. Has anybody responded to the super thanks shit? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Huh. Nice. Good. Uh, Thank you, guys. Well, we appreciate it. We're super thankful for the super chat and the super thanks. Super thanks. Yes, we're super. We're super grateful. It. It. it honestly, mm -hmm. <laughs> it really goes a long way. Mm -hmm. uh, and any little bit always helps the show. I don't care if it's a buck. I don't care if it's whatever. You know, it, it's 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 always appreciated. Always greatly appreciated. So. Amen. Amen. Yeah, no, really, I mean it from the bottom amen of my heart. and good morning and amen. And good night and good luck. All right, maybe we should get this guy in here because uh, we got to get rolling. This guy's got so much in his career. We got to wow. get to it all. You know what I mean? We got pictures. We got it all. Yeah, man. We got Let's our do first, it. We got first ESU bomb squad guy. Got on before wow. I was born. Uh, was a volley two years before I was born. Let's bring him in here. Detective Kevin B. Barry. <laughs> There he is. I told you I didn't like him. Look at him. You know, <laughs> you know he's, not, he's still not reacting him. to you. He's still not reacting. He doesn't care. You're not going to shake him. Lou, Lou, what yeah. is that on your shirt? Sydney, what is that? 
good for you. Good for you, Kevin. I'll take that. That's it. That's it, Detective. I did some research and I heard that the ESU guys used to call the FDMY guys rubbers because they had rubber coats. They would call them the rubbers of here. Is that true? <laughs> can you can you they can refer you, to you as the rubber men? The rubber uh, men. Uh, ah. See, so, see, it's you know what's bad? You know what's bad? Roof that he's got such a kind, nice face. He's probably an <laughs> ass kicker. Yeah. Like, he'll probably stop <laughs> your head. Yeah, yeah, There's no doubt. My, my favorite retirement thing is when I'm traveling and I'm on a cruise ship and there's somebody on the pool deck and wearing a fire department New York shirt. I walk by slowly. I look at it. I look at it. I go, Fidney, Fidney, what is that? Is that an organized group? He's a ball buster, you see? That's yeah, it, see? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I like it. Yeah. That's great. That means what is that, can a, get what is that a grunge band? What is Fiddy? What does that Fiddy. mean? What, what is a that? grunge band? Yeah. Well, I like that, Kev. Well, listen, before we get started, Pete, we got to do our, our uh, patriotic duties before Susie loses some cookies in there, bro. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, we are, besides being the number one podcast in the world, 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 world. We are the most patriotic podcast in the world. And uh, I bring you the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Fantastic. Fantastic. Gets me every time, man. It does. Get Magnificent you. sight. I passed the statue two weeks ago, leaving New York Harbor. It reminded me of 86 when they rededicated the statue. Mm. We had to go over with the Park Service before the Reagan's visit. Uh -huh. and we got to climb the statue and come out and actually walk around outside on the torch. That wow. is cool. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, one of the helicopters buzzed us. The torch is actually shaking. Really, <laughs> and you guys didn't even clip a, didn't even clip a safety. It, <laughs> it had a guardrail. You didn't need anything. Uh, uh, I got a guardrail. Good. See yeah. that? I'd be doing the kung fu grip on the guardrail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, listen. Before we get uh, get off the topic of the rubber man, I had a couple of uh, let's say rescue guys from back in the day say that you had a couple of names for you guys too. Uh, I think one of them was uh, ES Useless. And, oh, you know, I'm, I, I'm this, Mr. Barry, this wasn't me. This is other people. Were saying it, not Look at his face. <laughs> that's the sniper. Uh, that's where that joke went. Right into oh, the that's where that went. All right, moving right along. I won't say the other one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my well, God. One thing we, we hope to find tonight uh, and to solve the mystery is that uh, I've always said this. I don't know about you, Lou, but inside every great police officer is a firefighter dying to get out i know it i know it's in there because this man was a volley first right uh mr barry yes. yep. so tell us about uh, oh, boy. Oh, boy. calling in coming oh. in oh. it's the president, <laughs> the president. Oh. <laughs> he's he's embarrassed that you're on the phone we it's are somebody, on our podcast <laughs> it's somebody telling him somebody telling him yeah i i I know where he lives. We'll take care of this. <laughs> That's the FBI. The you guys that are listening in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. The FBI. <laughs> yeah, we like those guys. All, All right, right. So listen, 1966, you told us a little story about how, uh, what made you want to become a volley. You, you grew up in Wantaw, Long Island, right? Right out here in Long Island? Yes. Right. And uh, what, what happened that uh, made you decide to choose the uh, firefighting uh, lifestyle first? Uh during the 50s, I was riding my bike uh, about a mile from town, and I heard an explosion, a huge one. And then I heard the fire horns go off, not only in Wanto, they went off in Belmont, North Belmont. And um, we rode down to town, crossed over the bridge, over to Wanto Parkway, and there was equipment coming from Levittown, from Seaford, from Wanto, from Belmont, from all over. A T-33 jet trainer uh, had lost an engine and then trying to make it back to Mitchell Field, uh, I guess he had a flame out. And 
He apparently radioed. He was going to try and ditch in the Twin Ponds next to Wanto Parkway, just above the Lionel Railroad. And apparently he couldn't make it. And he came over the Sunrise Highway and actually put the plane down in the street rather than bail out because he was afraid of hitting all the houses. Wow. And the pilot was killed. Wow. Oh, he, he didn't make it. No. Was there anybody, was anybody else on board or just him? Just him. And um, he avoided the homes. And when I got on the scene, the fire trucks were just pulling up. And there was a car there. And I think it was made out of fiberglass. And the thing just melted. It really? Just melted away. And all you could see was the structure, the, the steel structure of the car. And it was like mind-boggling to me that this could just disappear like that. Right. Hmm. So did you have any family that were uh, volleys as well or volunteers or, you know, was that something that you started in your family? Well, I had five brothers. One was also a volley. Mm -hmm. uh, five out of the six were in law enforcement, everyone in a different agency. Wow. And I tell people I'm an only child. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that one. I like that one. What are the, what are the divisions of law enforcement were your brothers in? Well, uh, the youngest one was with the Greece Police Department up near Rochester, New York. After he retired from there, he retired as a lieutenant. He uh, worked for the DA's office up there and then worked for school security. And now he's living down in Georgia, learning a second language. Wow. Okay. Nice. Okay. Number five. Next one up. Uh, he was the commanding officer of the Connecticut State Police. Oh, wow. Um, Huge. Uh, he, he was an attorney and then went into the state troopers and uh, command, became the commanding officer in 16 years. Uh, retired and then went to work for one of the major uh, insurance companies on their fraud division. Uh, next one up, uh, he had a real job. He worked for Fuji Film. <laughs> and the next one up worked for Nassau County. Ah, uh, nice. Then me, New York PD, and then my oldest brother worked for the FBI. Oh, wow. Full family. And my brother say we'd rather say we had a sister worked in a whorehouse. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been fun around, uh, around uh, Thanksgiving Holy table. Michael. Holy mackerel. Right. <laughs> Any fist fights break out on <laughs> Thanksgiving? Did, uh, but now, was your father in law enforcement, or what, what uh, pushed you all you guys to law enforcement? Uh, I don't know. I was the first one to go in and... I guess they thought, if, you know, if I was making a few bucks, it might be worth their while. My right. father was in the shipping business uh, in New York City. Wow, so you were the pioneer. You were the trailblazer. You were the first guy to become uh, a, a police officer. Mm -hmm. and that was, when, did you, uh, when did you join the volleys, right? How, how far? Uh, 66. Well, like 66. 66. And I joined the police department two years later. Wow. Uh, but you rose the ranks, right? Didn't you rise the ranks so in, in the volleys? Uh, you were lieutenant, captain, uh, yes. company president, two-term member of the board of trustees. When did mm -hmm. you have time to do anything? Holy mackerel. Lifetime member for more than 50 years of service in the, in the Wantor Fire Department. Wow, that's amazing. Are you still in Wantor, Kevin? No, I'm currently in Bayport. Oh, all right. Yep. All right, so you take the test, uh, you get on in, in June of 68. When did you take the test? I took the test, I want to say it was in the fall of 67. Uh, 67? Uh, a couple of guys from the fire department uh, got together and said, hey, come on, we'll, we'll dare each other to take the test. <laughs> uh, I passed. One of the other guys, uh, he passed, but then he went to the MTA police instead. Hmm. Now, how come did you take the FD test, or you just you, you really didn't have an interest in it? You wanted to be, you knew you wanted to be a cop. Yeah, I, I wanted the police at the time. You did, okay. As did Mike Malone asked me last year, what would I tell young people today taking the police test? I told them take the fire test. Right. <laughs> <laughs> how my son that he just took the NYPD. <laughs> he doesn't want to be a fireman. He wants to be a cop. So, all right. Uh, do you remember? What the, do you remember what the pay was back then? <laughs> Uh, seventy four ninety three a year, if I recall correctly. Seventy four ninety three a wow. year. Wow. <laughs> were, you, were you married yet? You still single? No, single. So, all right. Not bad. Single and riding around in a sixty Volkswagen with no gas gauge. <laughs> <laughs> how uh, 
So that that was kind of when the city was just starting to get into uh, some sketchy times, right? I mean, that was kind of when things started to uh, snowball there. Uh, the yeah, city yeah, yeah man. Where, where was your first precinct? Well, I started on June 7th, and on July 4th, I was working in the Bronx in the Tactical Patrol Force. Nine months later, they brought us back to teach us what we should know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which you already found out how to do because you were oh, going day to day. Yeah, learning yeah. the hard way, right. When they said, oh, you're going to go to the 41 precinct on Simpson Street in the Bronx. I had to go to the Texaco station and get a map to find out where it was. <laughs> so, what was so, the Bron what was the Bronx like? Sorry, Petey. What was yeah, the Bronx yeah. like then? Was it was it starting to get crappy or was that it north was, or south? Was, where is it that? Was, it was getting nasty. Uh, the uh, the old timers taught you right away when you walk a sh certain streets on a foot post, you don't walk on a sidewalk. You walk out from the the curb so that if they throw something off the roof like a toilet, it won't reach that far. <sighs> Holy smokes! Wow! Wow! And and did you witness any stuff like that? Did you get you had stuff thrown at you as a rookie? And you know, like yeah, any other yeah, we had debris come off the roof uh, on numerous occasions that summer. You know, when the cold weather comes, it sort of died down a little bit. Now, did you do what the what the cops you know find a nice firehouse to hunker down in for a little while in those cold nights, or did you make uh, friends with the brothers? Actually, when the winter came. We were still wearing our summer jackets because the uniform supplier never finished the order. Of course. We finally got our winter jackets in December, and <laughs> it was the old choker with the choker collar, like a Nehru collar. Uh -huh. And fortunately, I was wearing underneath a fire department sweatshirt. And one time we stopped in to get warm at one of the firehouses. The guys invited us in that was on house watch because it was down way below freezing. And... We're in the back having a cup of coffee at their kitchen table, and the police shoe fly comes running in. And he said, Are there any cops in here? He looks around at everybody at the table. Everybody's got a fire department shirt on, including me. I said, no, they have half an hour, though. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, but man. we didn't get captured. Holy smokes. Perfect. That's all. So how long are you do Now, were you guys on a foot patrol by yourselves, or did you have a partner back then? At a partner, yeah, a partner. yeah, definitely. Uh, with being that green, you had to have one. And I gotta ask you since we ask all the firefighters, how long before you caught your first job? Let me ask you, how long before you had your first collar? I would say uh, two weeks, right? Right, and do you by any chance do you remember what that collar was, or was it something silly, or was it a big deal? No, it, up there was drugs, usually drugs on the upper stairwells or on the rooftops of the buildings. Right, 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 right. You know, occasionally uh, car, grand larceny from a car, you know, break in the vent windows and whatever. Right, right. So not not as big a deal, but the, the common occurrence, uh, the, the common occurrence, like uh, was like a hand to hand or like uh, things like that. Right. Like little small drug deals or were they big drug deals? No, they're, they're street level drug deals. Nothing yeah. big, but uh, you know, not, the entire neighborhood at one some time was high. Right. Yeah. <laughs> were you? Uh, were you yeah, no doubt. Were you trying to get closer to home, like work in Brooklyn or Queens or any of that, or you always like when you first got at on? That point, at that point, you don't say anything to anybody. You don't say nothing. Right, you right. just don't want to get in trouble because you're on probation. Right. Yeah. You, you do what they say and follow what they do, and that's that. Uh, after uh, the first year there, in December, I was assigned to a uh, temporary assignment to the 6th Precinct, Greenwich Village. And some years later, in 83, I went back there because that's where the bomb squad was housed. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's At cool the time, time, the 6th Precinct was the old building on Charles Street, not the new building. And it was, uh, uh, I think, a three or four story walk up to find your wooden locker. Ah, <laughs> wood, nice. the old wooden locker. I had a wood locker. You did, did it, right? 117, didn't I you? I did, yeah. Wow. And Very cool. Let's see. I, I stayed there until through the winter. And then I got assigned after the academy had brought us back uh, for uh, like two months. They, uh, I was assigned to the ninth precinct on the Lower East Side on East Fifth Street. Which is a very busy house too. Yeah. Why? Why do you think like that? To me, just 
why wouldn't you be, go back to the same? Like, why wouldn't you say, like, if we get assigned to an engine, we stay there until we want to transfer out of there. Like, to, to, to get moved around like that, it's just tough to, you, you, you know, don't have a choice. I know. I, I and, see that. And, but. and at the time, I was going to school at Farmingdale State University. So I went in and I spoke to the commanding officer and I said, you know, I do an eight to four. And I'm getting home at five, five thirty. I said, my classes, some of them are four or five o'clock. I said, I'm not going to be able to make my classes. I said, uh, if I put in a transfer, would you consider that? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put the thing in, put it down. I'll, I'll see what I can do. So two days later, I'm out on patrol on uh, where the men's shelter is on East Third Street. And there's a guy parked with a double parked car and the sanitation is coming down the street to do the street. So I walk over and everybody's got a store there. I walk in all the stores, tell the owners, move your car, sanitation's coming. Everybody except one tells me, no problem, they all go out. The one car doesn't move. So as sanitation comes up, I walk over and I write the summons for the car parked illegally. And with this, a rabbi comes running out. He says, what are you doing? I said, is this your car? I said, he asked everybody to move. He says, I got a card in the window. I'm a rabbi. I'm a rabbi. I said, yeah, and I'm the police. And he says, he says I'll have you transferred. I said, really? tell him Queens. Tell him Queens. <laughs> I went to the station house that afternoon, and the CEO was up behind the desk, and he sees me. He says, Barry, I want to see you. Oh, shit. Yes, Inspector. Oh, he goes, you know that transfer you asked for? Yeah. I think I can take care of that for you. I said, thanks very much. And I was in Queens in less than a week. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they got some pull. They got some hey, pull over that's there. That's what it means to have a rabbi. That's oh, that. it. That's it. <laughs> they got some pull. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they got some pull. Them uh, rabbis. Oh, oh my God! Uh, see, I don't know nothing about the PD. So, how long do you have to do a foot patrol before you get into a car with, with a partner? Is it? Well, in Queens, I was on foot, <clears throat> and I went to another. You know, I had National Street, which is out by 103rd Street and then Roosevelt Avenue. Right. So, you know, I'm walking up and down on a four to twelve. I see the condition on a day tour. I'm back doing it again, and again we got a double parking problem. So I turn around and I issue a couple of double parkers in front of a uh, a fruit market. And little did I know that the owner was an Italian guy who was connected. Oh, boy. Connected in like that? 15, connected. 15 minutes, a sergeant pulls up with the car. Get in the back. I got reassigned down to Woodside, 61st and most. Oh, like. my God. <laughs> Dude, I don't know how you, you can do that. You some powerful I... summons book, man. <laughs> yeah. well, a few months later, I was off foot and into a sector car, which was basically uh, ran from 108th Street and Northern to Flushing Bridge. It included the Van Wick, the Grand Central, the White Stone Expressway, the LIE, and all of Corona. And uh, a year or two later, I had an incident uh, with a kid that was arrested juvenile and the mother was all upset because she was alone and everything else and she said my son my son he, he, he said, i gotta get him a job so he said wait a minute and i went back to the fruit market because i met the owner after that nice fella and uh, i said to him i said morris i said uh, you think you could give this kid a job you know he's 16 whatever and he said send him in i'll give him a job and the mother was so happy that now the kid was going on the straight pass rather than the delinquent path. And she was thrilled. So things do turn around like that. Wow. Yeah. It's a happy well, ending story. When, I got to ask this question because I guess it's, I guess it's relevant. Uh, these guys talk about getting on the nozzle first time on the nozzle. When's the first time you had to pull your piece? Every night unloaded. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, not bad. He's quick. He's quick. I like it. I like he, it. He, he can hold his own at the kitchen table, man. I like all right, it. All right. All right. Is he being... You know, you be, a lot of be, times if you're climbing a hallway, uh, look at the drug dealers and stuff like that, and you hear noise in that, you do, because a lot of times they are armed with weapons, mostly knives. You know? Right. And years ago, the old holsters uh, were difficult, especially if you're wearing that long overcoat in the winter where... The, 
the coat was over your holster, over the belt, and everything right. else. You, you couldn't reach through your pocket to get your gun. Oh. Yeah, right. That right. doesn't happen too fast. No. no. Yeah, now they have the zipper that pulls up over the holster and all that stuff. Everything right. changed. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so yeah. So you'd have to pull your and you you have what the thirty eight the, sp yeah. the special. Yeah. So no, you'd 30, have maybe maybe a flashlight. 30, 30, 30, 30. So you'd go up the stairs maybe with a flashlight and that thirty uh, that that police pistol, the six shooter. Yes. Whoa, that's not uh, that's not like today where you got seventeen oh. rounds. <laughs> And uh, yeah. no, no boying. That I, that's actually minus boying because more rounds yeah, yeah. equals more life, bro. They have more equipment than a, a, a telephone lineman. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 the old days with the telephone. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, Kevin. Does is it normal for PD when when guys get on to bounce around like that? Like, is that a common thing now? If if guys get on like that, or are they assigned to a precinct and they stay there? I, I honestly don't know. I'm out uh, 20 years next month. Um, you know, we were put out right away because of all the trouble with the protests at City College and that and the death of Martin Luther King. That all happened at the same time. So we were just pushed out without any training and just told to be careful. <laughs> be careful. Here you go. See you later. And, and you got on the tactical patrol unit right away, right? So what was that? unit like was that a special unit uh or was that just sort of like another like an introduction to another unit that you might be able to get on in the future like what was what was that like tactical patrol was uh, work six to two at night that was their only shift and they were put into high crime precincts and they were available for rapid mobilization if something happened mm. where they could move you throughout the 77 precincts at the time and uh, tpf Later it became known as the people's friend, not terror, punishment, and fear. <laughs> <laughs> also known as. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And was that does is that a career stepping stone? Because like I got a buddy right now who's in. Uh, oh God, what they just renamed the unit. Uh, it's the neighborhood safety teams that now they're calling them. They used to be the undercover. Uh, guys who kind of jump out, but that that's a it's been a real blessing for his career. It's moving him ahead very quickly. Uh, being on this team is is being on a high speed team like the T -T TPU, like you know, does that help your career? The tactical patrol force was known for making a lot of arrests, and from there, the jumping stone was going to the detective bureau and or to specialized units uh, like street crime, narcotics. And undercover details. Right. Did you ever go to any of that undercover uh, stuff? And, you know, like, how was that if you did? No, too scary for me. Right. <laughs> too scary. <laughs> Somehow, I don't think so. I don't think so. Pete, do we have any older pictures before ESU? Or? No. No. <clears throat> no they, they didn't have cameras in those things. <laughs> <laughs> sure they did. You know what? They didn't explode the powder. The 1899. Said, 1899, somewhere around there. So what what brings you in the in the direction of ESU then? What uh, what makes you want to? And what was the process like trying to get into ESU at that time? It was very difficult. Um, I put applications in. I put an application in every couple of months. And you don't hear anything. And I don't want to make a long story longer, but I'm parking my car in Park Avenue across the street from the apartment where I live, facing the firehouse, which was about three or four blocks away. So I could make a rapid response, running across, making sure I didn't get hit by a car crossing the road, jump in my car and drive there. And this guy pulls up and parking, he parks his car in the driveway across the street. And it's a nondescript, like a 66 um, Chrysler 400. And he's got a half dozen antennas on the car. And I just look at it like that and he gets out and he's walking over to me. And he said to me, you with the PD? I said, yeah. He said, transit? I said, no, NYPD. He said, oh, yeah, where do you work? So I said, obviously, he's a neighbor. I'm, I said, I, I work in a 110. Do you like it there? I said, yeah, I like it, but uh, I'm busy. And I said, I've had an application in for emergency service. He says, give me your name, your information. <clears throat> Turns out my neighbor across the street was the police commissioner's brother-in-law and driver. Oh, <laughs> come on. Oh, come on. Yeah, hold on, uh, and 
And I have lived through that worst. I have lived there almost a year and didn't know it, you know, because the guy was always gone. Right. And right. Uh, I want to say about three months later, I got interviewed. And uh, Good then for I you, was. Man. So hey, that's how it works. So you could, no, your, you could put your application in and you don't even get interviewed. You have to keep putting it in. How long does your application no. stand for? It, it was there for six months. When, once he made the call, I was interviewed in two weeks. Wow. Well, holy shit. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I know that it takes a lot of like, you got to have every hook in the book. Uh, especially now, oh, I've been yeah, I've been hearing I've been hearing a lot about that from my buddy who just got on that uh, special unit. So, yeah, it, it, the NYPD's got a lot of like hoops to jump through to hey, get Coops, there. Have you noticed a little bit more engagement, maybe oh, from a little, producer, pep like, from a little pep, you know, <laughs> oh, a little right. bit more excitement? I just know more about <laughs> cops than I know about firefighting. Look, it's not oh, this. <laughs> Hold on, who am I? Pete, bring up the picture, Pete. <laughs> Pete, yeah, bring up the picture. I Pete. know nothing about firefighting. I know a right. lot more about PD. That's oh, just uh, uh, <laughs> Detective Barry, thank you for making Pete's uh, year. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Look at him here, though. Oh, Look at what's going on look here. That guy. You know, when hey, they're putting the police. Wait, that's like in the to... issue. Back it up. I'm not up to that yet, fella. Oh. He's excited. Oh, I don't know. Well, he's all over the place. Too. I thought we were talking about ESU. We just got I, off this interview. In there yeah, he got the interview. Right? Oh, okay. okay. What, what, uh, what are they looking for? What kind of questions could they possibly ask you in the interview? They wanted to know my experience, and I told them I had to fight upon my experience. And I told them that uh, I'd actually been using the Hearst tool for at least a year, and they were just getting them at the time. Right. And uh, we talked about uh, resuscitators and Amble bags, and I said, yeah, I said, I've already got my EMT. And they said, oh, well, that's one thing you won't have to go for, because all the emergency service guys in the 70s were EMTs. At least right. they EMT were better. And now when you so, apply, can they put you in whatever truck they want to put you in, right? Whatever borough they want to put you they in? They can you put you to... anywhere in the city. But right. I turned around and I said to the guy, the neighbor, I said, where'd you work? He said, one. I said, that's where I want to work. He said, no problem. So Again, first, the guy's just me. I got an opening. It's up in three in the Bronx. Hell yeah! I said it's a little difficult. They charge you money to go there. <laughs> yeah. The Triborough Bridge or whatever Throgsnick, mm -hmm. I think, was about fifty cents at the time. Yeah, big Ooh. money. Yeah. And, hey, uh, do we, we ever get? Do we ever get this guy's oh. name? This mysterious neighbor? Do you ever get his name? Oh yeah, yeah. We're, we're uh, good uh, friends. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's just one of those. Yeah. yeah. So you go up to? They send you up to three. Then do they send no. you? For Oh, they they want to send me, and then all of a sudden the orders come down. I was in one. So when I got there, everybody said, "How'd you get here?" Uh -huh. I said, "I drove, and I came through the front door." <laughs> so, With so, the street face. For the guys who don't know, people in the chat don't know. Truck one covers what? Uh, uh, Lower Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan, Fifty Ninth Street South. Fifty Ninth Street South. There you go. Basically, if there's <laughs> something going on in Manhattan, they got it. Right. Now, at the time, did they have the big truck and the little satellite trucks, too, or was it just one big truck? At the time, we were using station wagons, carry-alls, and the large emergency service truck, the International. Holy shit. Wow. So when they do finally send you to one, do they send you to training before you go there, or you they train you in-house? How does it work? At the time, I trained in-house. And basically, I knew most everything on the rig, with the exception of some of the sniper weapons. And right. some of the uh, machine guns that they had, hey. and also um, the generator. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Started talking Sorry. generators. I was competent because I had worked on our uh, floodlight truck for a while in Wantua, so I knew the the equipment. And I actually became a certified chauffeur. I think in the fourth month I was there. Wow! <laughs> Did they have the scuba then too, Kevin? Uh, no, yet. scuba came later. Uh, in fact, I got uh, scuba certified when I was in the bomb squad, and we had to have a certain number of people uh, for below water level. And um, when I was in emergency service, um, I was one of the few people, new people, came on that could drive a stick shift. That's right. And, that's right. Uh, after I was there a year or so, maybe two years, uh, was sent out to Floyd Bennett where I 
received a uh, class one license for tractor trailers, singles, doubles, triples, <laughs> asthma. So I had every class, including uh, uh, motorcycle, uh, nice. you know, two wheel. And that's a tough course, right? The the motorcycle course because you had those heavy Harleys and you had to weave in and out of the cone. <clears> and all. Yeah, yeah, you can fall off. And when it does, <laughs> they're heavy and they hurt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. But actually, uh, in nineteen. I want to say 1990 something. We had a job up in two trucks area in Harlem, and uh, we asked for the total containment vessel to come from a truck in Brooklyn, and they didn't have uh, somebody available to move it. So I said, "Well, let's go to two truck where they had the old LaGuardia carry stored," and they said, "We don't have anybody qualified." And I turned around. And the chief of the department was there, uh, Bob Johnston, and I said, "Hey, chief." I said, can one of these guys take me to two truck and I'll bring it back? And he goes, you're qualified? I said, yeah, I'm qualified 20 something years ago. And he said, yeah, do it. So it was a big surprise when I showed up with the bomb carrier and then had to get out and put the suit back on to put the stuff into the truck. <laughs> He's a do it. It's like a James Bond, this guy. So uh, Kevin, mm -hmm. so at this point, you're on the job of about five years, give or take, six years, something like that? 68 to 74. Yeah, 74. so six years. So, yeah. who, so in this time frame, we didn't really touch on it because we're trying to explain uh, like all the stuff with the PD. Who, who, some people that stuck out to you that really that you latched onto? You know, that were, were teaching you a lot of stuff, whether it was for PD or ESU or any of that <clears> stuff. <throat> who, who were the people you remember that really were, were people that you looked up to? A lot of the guys on one truck. Uh, I've seen saw them do some amazing things. Um, besides. We had guys that climbed bridges they, like they were monkeys. I climbed the bridge. I'm a little more careful. Um, yeah, yeah. When I was there, I, I guess I was there uh, about six months. And I turned around and I was looking at the what we call the Morrissey belt, which was the, uh, the wide belt with the double straps and a hook with a handbrake on the hook. And you use your three-quarter manila rope to repel. And I looked at the equipment and I turned around and I went over and I spoke to the sergeant. He said, sergeant, not for nothing, uh, these belts are obsolete. I said, there's mold on the rivets. And he goes, yeah, but there's no money in the budget. So I said, okay, all right. He said, just be careful. So a few <laughs> months later, there was a fireman whose brother was in a nine truck in, in, in Brooklyn. And he was doing a rope rescue up in Harlem and the rope broke and he was killed. And I think the person he was bringing down was killed. Yeah. What happened was the manila hope rope that they use a three quarter manila hump, hump rope had been in storage for 20 years. It was so dry rotted that when they put weight on it, it snapped and the rope broke when he was like three stories up yeah. trying to make his way down with that. The next day, the inspector, from our division shows up in one truck, says hello for coffee. And I said, Inspector, these belts are obsolete. He said, well, put it on paper and send it to me. So, so I did. About two months later, I don't hear anything at all. And he comes by the truck, said hello. And I said, Inspector, I wrote you about the belts and that. I said, the Abba Safety Company in Brooklyn will test them for us for free, no charge. And they'll stress test them and tell you if they're any good. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm working on it. Just like that. So I looked and I said, smart ass. I said, oh, I hope you're not waiting for Christmas, Inspector. Uh, he left. And within an hour, I got a phone message from the office that I was being reassigned there, pending uh, reassignment back to patrol. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I had to go back across the street to see my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the neighbor. <laughs> The hey, cool. Good thing I wasn't oh. in PD, huh? Holy oh, crap. Man. I would have been all over, over the place. <laughs> I'm there the first week, and I come in on a Monday afternoon for 4 to 12, and I, I walk in the office, and this is the old 8-7 in Brooklyn by the BQE. Uh, I see a, a bunch of belts on different desks in the office, and I'm going one, two, three, four, I'm counting them. I'm up to like 15 or 16, and I said, what's with the belts? And the guy on the desk looks at me and says, didn't you hear? I said, no. He said, they went to the Atlas Safety Company over the weekend. They tested 19 belts. I said, yeah. He said, 19 broke. Every belt in the division is condemned. Wow. So I said, oh, wow, that's, that's a good sign. You know, 
Now, an hour later, I'm on the desk, fill in as a paperwork guy, and who calls in but the inspector? And I answer the phone, and, Inspector, Inspector Wynn. I said, yes, Inspector, how are you? He says, I just want to tell you that was a good idea. I said, what was that? He said, the belts, the test of belts. That was a good idea. I said, I got another good one for you. He said, what's that? I said, cancel my transfer. <laughs> Done. Wow, but, nice. But fortunately, after that, they replaced them, and they got better belts, and they also got additional um, extenders so that when the guys climbed the bridge, they had more mobility and space to move around the bridge. Wasn't keeping them so tight to the uh, cable, right? Uh, yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. I think we used, to, we used the Atlas belts too, Ruffy, in the life saving world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had the same Atlas belts. Yep. And we used yeah, the we same. Used to carry it on the bag. Yeah. Yeah. And we used those when we first started repelling in 1975. Wow. Out of helicopters down at Floyd Bennett Field. You were doing it. Yeah. Jeez. 1975. Uh, yeah, I we was, were flying uh, around. What was it like? I was going to Oh, go okay, ahead, Kevin. I'm the, sorry. The, the police pilot. Um, and let's see. I want to see Rawlings. Um, he was a uh, an Army vet, and the police department had gotten two used Army UEs. And they were actually flying these with training, and they were still in the Army colors. Uh, Rowley was the pilot's name. And he's flying a helicopter, and I'm watching from behind on the jump seat because we're going to rappel. And he's still turning the, the book, reading the, the manual on how to fly the thing. And I said, hey, Jimmy, it looks doesn't look good. You're reading the book and trying to fly oh, this no. thing. <laughs> he was an excellent pilot. A few <clears throat> years later, he was doing a traffic survey over the Brooklyn waterfront, and a seaplane landed on top of him, and he crashed. He was oh, killed. Shit. oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you get the training to repel out of helicopters? That couldn't have been in house. They, had, they sent you down to Floyd Bennett to train on that. Yeah, took it down from guys who were army vets in, in the division. That's amazing. And was that like more fast roping, or was that more like on the harness? No, it was in the harness. Fast roping came later. Uh, a little safer if you're doing it on a high rise building in Manhattan, which we did. Right. You swing quite a bit in the wind. <laughs> Yeah, there's this thing up there called the wind. Who yeah. knew? Yeah, who knew? Who knew? <laughs> well, so you worked in truck one. Did you did you do any time in, in, in the other trucks before you went to the bomb school? You spent most of your time in truck one. In 79, 79, 80, uh, the gas crisis came and uh, emergency was going through another takeover with new bosses and name changes and everything else and new so we decided we'd move and we went out to nine truck but nine truck was actually closed due to the cutbacks and it was moved into the seven five where seven used to be located so we were working out of nine truck quarters covering queens from brooklyn huh. and at that point my partner uh got promoted to sergeant and my old partner went from one truck prior to that uh to ten and i left nine and went to ten to work with him so how and does it work on, on the truck? How many guys are on the on each vehicle? Because I know you have the little remote ones. I know you have the big truck. What, what's the staffing like on those things? The staffing is two on each. And the truck normally has the sergeant. The big and if truck it doesn't, it has truck. the most senior person who's referred to as in charge. Right. Uh, so how, how does it run? Do, do they roll on... Because what is it? There's two little, uh, little satellite trucks and there's one big truck in every up, area. Up to, we had up to four small vehicles from 59th to uh, the battery. Not all the time do we have the staffing to run it. We always minimum two plus the truck, the big truck. And, and who would roll? Would all of you roll on it or whoever got there first? On the assignment. If it was a jumper, the truck would roll because we had the poles and the nets on the big truck. Uh, if you had a cardiac, it'd be just one car, or we call them truck. Right. And if uh, it was something big, you all of you would respond? If it was Yeah, a, if it was a barricade, barricade or, or something like that, yeah. Yeah, hostage situation, everybody would respond. And then additional citywide units are automatically rolled on that, too, including, like, the hostage team. Right. Uh, did you have any hairy uh, see that pick P2, Wallace. Uh, Any hairy jobs that you could speak of? You tell a story about any of these, you know, good jobs well, that you had? We had a hostage job 
and uh, Frank Bowles was a sergeant, and uh, he was in charge of the hostage unit. Whoa! Oh, busy guy. guy. This guy's a busy guy. Sorry. That's a okay, all right. Yeah. FBI. <laughs> <laughs> I carry a badge. From Barry Oh my gosh. Sounds like a Christmas ornament or something. There we go. Okay. I tried okay. to cut the wire, but I couldn't have a shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, where were we? Uh, your hairy situation with your hostage. Yes, we have a hostage situation, and we're in a tenement in the Bronx. A guy is holding two kids hostage in the apartment and threatening to kill them. And we're... Uh, we're on the stairs. Charlie Craig is in front of me. I'm behind him. And he's got somewhat of a shield that we had. And I have a Ithaca Deer Slayer shotgun with a 14-inch barrel with double up buck. This Wait to see if this guy's coming out or we're going in. <clears throat> and Frank Bowles is behind us, and he's got his portable radio. And at this point, everybody is on one frequency at the time. There's not as many frequencies as they have today. And the dispatcher was calling him, uh, you know, citywide Sergeant Bowles. Yeah. Uh, be advised the, uh, the Connecticut State Police has got the relatives. Uh, one of their troop cars is headed your way and we'll advise you when they get in closer. And he says, OK, advise detectives one about that. See, detectives one acknowledges. And with this, the guy's inside. He's screaming and yelling. So we're careful, you know, being careful that he doesn't charge out the door. With this, uh, the sniper teams are now in place. And it's sniper team one to Sergeant Bowles, clear sight picture, meaning he's got the target. Request a green light. And he stand by. And then a couple minutes later, sniper team two, we have a clear sight picture with question a green light. Stand by. With this, detectives one to Sergeant Bowles. And he says, uh, stand by. Uh, sniper team one, we have a clear sight picture. No obstruction. Request in the green light. And the guy goes, uh, detectives one, we have the information about the relative coming. Do you want it? And Bowles standing there, didn't realize one had stepped on the other. He said, yeah, go ahead, shoot. Oh, oh no way. Wow. So wow. He's and I turn around, he's got his portable radio with the big brick ones. And I said, excuse me, Sarge, but the Detective team transmitted a message about the information, and the sniper team asked for a green light. And I said, "You just said shoot." I said, and now he's crushing the radio, saying, "Belay that order. Nobody move. Stand fast. Hold your fire. Don't move." And I just looked at him. He said, "Hey, Sarge, do you see your whole career going down the shit shoot right now?" <laughs> <laughs> the shit shoot. Yeah. Wow. Now he later became a lieutenant and a captain who was the CO of the hostage team for years. I, he's, I'm still in touch with him today. He's a great guy. He's in his mid-80s. Frank Bowles. So the guy never took the shot, though? No, nobody took the shot. Oh, the guy God. Came, wow. Can you imagine? At that point, Whew. the guy came running out the door. And I was standing there holding my fire. Shoot. <clears throat> and he said, I'm coming out, I'm coming out, shooting. And he... We hear the footsteps. What he did was he sent the one girl out who was a deaf mute, seeing if we were going to shoot. <clears throat> wow. So after that, we just went in after him. And that was the end of the story. That's all. Wow. That, that's like when... Uh, you can't make that up. Bro. When the dispatcher's talking to the chief, right? And he's asking him a question. And he's like, yeah, give me a second. Yeah. Me, and then they punch in the second alarm. <laughs> yeah, give me a second. Hold on. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Uh, no. Whew. I well, we're still in truck one here. I got. I have to ask. Yeah, you I, know, I was any, waiting. I was did waiting. you have any run-ins with Rescue One, or because you seem like you you would get along with everybody? So, what's the whole real story? My advantage is that when in our area, any conflict with jobs, you know, like dual operational procedures or responses, came with Rescue One, and I knew several of the guys that were neighbors of mine. Right. So we'd show up on the scene. I'd walk over. Hi guys, how you doing? And the other guys are coming to you. What are you talking to the enemy for? They said, because I'm just solving a problem so we don't have any conflict here. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so, 
later on when I went to the bomb squad, I would come up with uh, actually uh, one of the first laptop computers that I had, a Mac. And that was in the early 80s. And I would bring video up of bomb scenes and show them the events and show them on one where they had actually had a car bomb and the guy detonated it. And when he did, it blew a hole through a gas tank. It was in the trunk. And the gas poured out and the fire service, I think it was out like in uh, Colorado. They were parked across the street. They were taking cover behind the rig and they had their lines ready. But the gas poured out and it went across right on, set their rig on fire. Oh, oh. shit. <laughs> and I said, this is the reason why we tell you distance and covering is what you need. I said, you know, when we arrive, we ask you to set up over here, uh, over there. We might ask you to step, go into a side street. That's to give you protection in case right. there is explosion because the frag goes right through glass windows. It doesn't give you any cover. Right. So I never had an issue really with anybody. Where did that, where did the, because uh, there, there was, you probably didn't, because uh, you, you seem like a reasonable, calm guy who wants to get the job done. But where did most of that animosity come from then? Just was it one particular guy? Was it a few, you what, know, what I, listen, just, everybody's uh, competing for the same jobs when it comes to certain things, whether you got a scaffold hanging. <clears throat> so listen, it, 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 that's definitely going to happen where everybody's kind of moving independently, yeah, maybe initially. In the 70s, everybody was looking for production, production. We need jobs, produce, whatever. I used right. to say, hey, if they get there first, it's their job, unless they say they need a hand. Mm -hmm. And we go over and say, you guys need a hand? No. Okay. All right. Then we'll either stand by or we'll hit the road and tell the dispatcher that you're handling it. Right. Um, I, I always felt like Manhattan, I, I used, in, in East New York, I really never had a problem with ESU. But I yeah. would say probably in the in the more, you know, limelight, let's say, you know, like, uh, you, you know, figure Manhattan, you might have more of an issue because you are competing, you know, to certain jobs. Uh, and it's more of a high, uh, you know, spotlight area, you know, like to say, I guess. Well, one story I, I tell, and it's it involved Rescue One and, and a couple other uh, um, companies that responded to a high rise fire in Hell's Kitchen. And it was a, a building with uh, three elevator shafts. And when we got there, fire was on the scene. And uh, rescue company were just coming in the door. And we had come in another side door. And the firemen were all looking at the rescue company. And he came in. And he's got this giant wooden box that's about three feet wide by two feet. So he puts it down on the ground. He opens it up. And I look. And I said, boy, this guy's got some collection. He must have every elevator key. That was ever made. <laughs> so the guy I'm with, Don Porter, easygoing guy, I said, Don, they're here, it's their job, we'll just stand by. So he gets out and he takes a key and he puts it in the door and he puts it through and turns it, doesn't work. He takes another key out and he puts it in, doesn't turn. And he puts a third or fourth key in and it doesn't turn. And now the other <laughs> guys from the, the engine company saying, hey, come on, are you going to open the door or what? And I said to the guy, listen, I said, you're using the right key, but this elevator has a facade door, meaning a fancy outside skin. I said, you can't let the key drop. It was a drop key right. on the inside. Right. I said, That's you it. have to go all the way through to ah, the elevator. Ah, right, to the elevator door, right, right, right. Door. He turns to me and he goes, you think you can open the door? <laughs> so I looked at him and said, no, I'm sure I can open the door. Oh. And he goes, he steps back. He goes, go ahead. So I take out an elevator key. I put it in. I turn it. And I open the doors. And the elevator is there. It's half stalled with people there. And I take the key out. And I close the door. And I said, now, go ahead. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, his, the two companies razzed him. <clears throat> oh, sure. Nice. You, know, you know what? Was, I was just thinking about it while, we, while you were talking about that. When we were in 288, uh, when I was a boss there, and we ran in with ESU, you know, mostly on the highway for the most part. You know, we didn't mm -hmm. have high rises, too, not too many issues with that. But, you know, under the train, we used to see them and stuff like that, man, unders. But yeah. it, there was a few guys that if I saw, I knew it was going to be good, right? I had a couple. I had the one in uh, 
on Main Street and Northern Boulevard, there was a, a bus into uh, plowed through some stuff into the scaffolding, killed some people, crushed some people, and you know screwed up the building. We had to shore up the building, and the guys that I remember working with seeing those particular guys, I don't think you know there was always maybe one guy that I would know notice that you know either he was talking a little bit more or whatever. But there was for the most part, and and we've said this before, not just on this on here, but even talking with the guys. Uh, if I seen faces that they could trust me, I could trust them, then there would never really be an issue. In fact, I had, I was telling Kev before, the, you know, when we were talking about it in ESU guys, when I was in East New York, I remember f passing my tool, I'm having the guys pass the tools across the hood because we had the cutters, they had the, the, uh, the spreaders and we, we worked together. They, we, they, they gave us their tool. We gave them our tool and, and we went back and forth, which is rare. I mean, that's a rare thing. You never give up your tool. You never pass it to a cop, obviously, but <laughs> it's it just how it was. You know, we felt we'll those, those guys back. were comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you give me yours first, <laughs> but it wasn't, that's the truth. I'm not making that up. That's how it went. But well, I can't see, say, you know, depends on a who lot of got. people don't realize ESU. When I was there, we were sent to, to an elevator school. We had elevator mechanics and elevator inspectors for the city teach us the ins and outs. We used to be able on the old type elevators that you got in low Manhattan, uh, like the gate. We used to use wooden sticks to hit the relays. Yeah, and yeah, jump yeah. And, and override. Yeah, yeah, to move them. And they'd say, "Isn't that dangerous?" And we'd say, "Yeah, but we always wear rubber sole shoes." <laughs> you could use a chalk too. The wood chalks would work for that too. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a, a lot of them, you pull out a fuse pill, a fiberglass fuse pull and they don't know what it is. But after we went to elevator school, we didn't need the keys anymore. We used strictly a Z wire. And you can uh -huh. open 90, 95% of elevators with just a Z wire. We but you, you have to know how to use it. And it's a great tool. And it costs nothing. Yeah. I yeah. always used to say, I never like to force the door because inevitably we would come back there because it just screwed up the door over time, you know, especially yeah. in the projects or any of that stuff. So yeah. if we could use that Z tool used to work really well, actually, we used yeah. to use that tool quite a bit. Yeah. And I only, I only saw that, you know, in, uh, in Brooklyn, I, I never saw that in Queens actually. Well, I can remember one incident we had an elevator mechanic in the motor room on a roof of a, I'd say a 20 story building. And his hand was caught under the cables Ooh. in the full weight of the, the car and the counterbalance was wow. on his hand and you could see the cable pushing through his fingers in his hand. And I look and I said, new guy with me said, what, how did he do this? I said, well, he was probably using a cloth on the cable to hold it and running the, the car up and down to see if there was any frayed cable. If there was a fray, it would pull the to let him know. Well, yeah. what he forgot to do was let go of the cloth. So he says, we get there. He says, cut the cables, cut the cables. Now, first of all, you can't cut the cables because you got weight. The counterbalance is way more than the car. So what we did is we took Crosby clamps, put them on the cables, and then used the floor of the motor room and the hearse tool to lift it to pry open, push the cable up off the drum and get his hand out. But he's saying, I, I cut the cables. I know what I'm doing. Finally, after the third, I know what I'm doing. I said, if you knew what you were doing, you wouldn't be in this position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if we did but what I he said, you wouldn't have any fingers. If Woody had gone right to the police, this yeah. would have never. No, I can tell you, going to scenes where more than, in my time in emergency, more than a dozen elevator mechanics were killed. Oh, yeah. By shortcuts. And they got wedged between the car and the the, the, the wall, the car and, and the floor, crushed them to death, took their legs off. I mean, it was terrible. But you know, everybody thinks they got a quicker way to do the job, and that's when they get careless. Yeah, shortcuts. They'll get. You. That's on every job. That's on our job too, right? Oh yeah. You can take a shortcut. Yeah. Uh, so, how many years? Nine years. You got assigned wow. to the bomb squad. Uh, so. What was that? What made you interested in going to the bomb squad? And what was it like? What did you have to do to get to the bomb squad? Well, you have to go through a series of interviews. And the reason I did apply for it was my partner from one 
Don Porter, who I'd worked with since uh, 74, was retiring in 82. So I put an application in for the bomb squad. And that New Year's Eve, uh, Richie Pastorella and Tony Sumpf were seriously injured at police headquarters when a device went off uh, as they were trying to take the bomb blanket off of the bomb that had been covered by ESU. And what happened was it was strictly just a hang fire. It had counted down on the timer and stalled. The connection just stalled. When they moved the blanket, the connection was made, the device functioned. But Richie lost part of one of his hands. He lost both eyes. Tony lost one eye and was launched through the air about 40 feet into a brick wall. Both of them suffered very, very serious injuries. And uh, I'm still in touch with both of them today. So, wow. But uh, I applied and went for an interview. And I'd been through the same type of interview for emergency service. They want to make sure that you're not a chance taker, that you will take a risk, but you don't take a chance. You won't flip a coin, just go, yeah, heads or tails. And then I had to be interviewed by the department psychiatrist, which was Dr. Harvey Schlossberg, who was a cop who got his PhD. And he had been on many hostage jobs where I was. And I walk in, I sit down and I said, hey, Doc, how are you? Just call me Harvey. I said, I will call you Harvey because I know you're that law. <laughs> he goes, oh, Kevin, come on. Why do you want to go to the bomb squad? I said, well, it's, I'm tired of climbing bridges, talking to nuts, jacking up subway <laughs> cars, putting people in body bags, that kind of stuff. I said, you know, I'm, I'm getting to the age where climbing bridges is tiring. He goes, all right, what's the real reason? I said, I love the noise. That's why I want to go. <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> Do you have, did you have to, uh, what kind of training did you have to go through then? Did they send you somewhere for training or that was yes. in-house too? They did. That was February. Uh, I went to training uh, six weeks down in Redstone Arsenal at the U.S. Military Munitions Center at the Redstone Arsenal. And uh, we were taught for six weeks every everything from uh, heavy ex high explosives to detonators, firing circuits, military explosives. And I came back in July. We had a new CO come in, was rearranging things. And I had worked with two senior guys who were very good my first couple of six months there. And I was there in February, trained back in July. In September, I wound up uh, as a team leader. And I went into the boss and I said, why are you putting me in as a team leader? There's guys here that have been here longer that are kind handlers. I said, and they should actually take the lead. And he said, uh, can you do the job? I said, yeah, I can do the job. I said, but you're bouncing a guy. He said, I'm bouncing a guy because he doesn't have the training that you have. And he said, if you can do the job, it's yours. If not, tell me and I'll send you someplace else. So I took the job and I <laughs> remained the lead until I retired. And that also happened with another fellow that came in the same time with yeah. me. And, Kay. and we both had our own teams for uh, almost 20 years. How many teams are there, Kevin, in, in the city? Yeah, At the time the when I was there, there were six teams when I got there. Most teams had three. Some had two. And teams that had two always had to have somebody uh, change tours and, and – do a chart change to cover the midnight, the, the overnight tour. We worked a day, a day, and then a 1,400 to 0,800 uh, night duty. Um, that worked up until the mid 80s. And then uh, there was an incident where there were multiple jobs on a midnight tour and they didn't have the coverage. And Chief Johnston, Robert Johnston turned around and said, There'll be more people. You're going to have minimum manning, minimum response. And I don't want to hear about the lack of response capabilities. It was a time prior to that where we were picking up a piece of military ordnance in midtown Manhattan, say at Grand Central Station, a grenade. In the meantime, the dispatcher's saying, well, I got a pipe bomb out in the 103, and I've got also a suspicious package in the 44. And we're one team working at night. Wow. So. Is that on first? Yeah, no doubt. Is that now, what now the capabilities? I don't know the capabilities now. It's a well kept secret. But 
they have boku boku personnel and huge amounts of equipment stuff when i saw a couple of years ago what they had i was just utterly amazed the amount of equipment good they had. do you think that that was like every every unit whether you're in the fdny and nypd has their quote unquote bullshit run what what kind of runs were you doing like we do like you said i know suspicious package i'm sure you're going to those things you know every five minutes is that something that you were constantly going to like you know you're not always going to a pipe bomb but is, is that the kind of run that you were getting mostly no in fact the esu would be the first ones dispatched to the suspicious package they would arrive on scene and evaluate and filter the jobs because you couldn't keep up with it the, right the right right program. right and uh, they were very good at it you know you see a package you know if it was a sensitive location like if they said oh we have something in the basement of the the UN, you know, it was, you're going. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you I did, can remember. Sorry, sorry, uh, yeah. Kevin. You did send us some really awesome photos here, and I just don't want to miss them. This was something with Black September. You want to tell us about what happened with this? Uh, these two? Yes. They, Black September put three car bombs in New York in 1972. One at Kennedy Airport as a diversion, uh, one at the Israeli embassy, and one at the LL Airlines on Fifth Avenue. Um, the person that built a device used a E cell. An E cell is a countdown timer. It's like when you open your car door and you close it, the light doesn't go off immediately. It counts several seconds and then the light dims and goes off. Well, that's how the switch closes and functions the device. It was built that way. They gave it to a guy to deliver these cars and he saw this thing he didn't know what it was and he was pretty smart he said i know what the potholes are in new york at the time so he cut one of the wires and put a toggle switch in when he did it it killed the functioning device of the e-cell and none of the devices ever fired wow but i called up trying to get the credit for the bombs uh, at the um, airport and at the Israeli embassy and at LL. And they said, listen, thanks very much, but nothing's gone off. You don't have any bombs. And finally he called a radio station and gave him the plate number of the car at one of the locations. They found it. And where'd they find it? What did we have in New York in the seventies? The towway program. It had been picked up by a tow police tow truck no, and taken to the over on lot? 38th street in the North river. And there yeah. were two <laughs> car bombs on the, and the, the bomb squad went there, had to open the trunk and work on the pier in the trunk of the car, separating the explosives. So uh, what you told me in the pre-show was that this is a bunch of Semtex right here. Um, yes. How much how much damage could that have done? And can you explain to everybody what Semtex is and what it does? Semtex is a commercially manufactured explosive from, I want to say, from Poland. It is uh, a very high resonance explosive. Uh, has a detonation velocity probably of 28, 29,000 feet per second. <sighs> and if you had that much in that car, uh, you would take out more than likely a third of a city block, take out Holy all of the stores and cause fires. Because in that shit. car with the gasoline, there were several five gallon cans of gasoline and several 20 pound propane cylinders. It would have sent the propane cylinders flying and an impact would have exploded, sent the gasoline all over the street and set the buildings on fire. Wow. Sheesh. You know what I wanted to ask you? Now that we're getting a little deeper into this. Are you guys just getting the bomb or, or a pipe bomb or whatever it is. I mean, obviously something like that it seems really high tech, I guess, or low tech, but high tech. Like, are you, are, you, is, are you there with the snips, like either guessing red or blue wire, or are you putting the bomb into something and then taking it somewhere else? Like, what, what, how does the process work? I never understood what, like, what are you actually doing? Well, we try not to do a render safe on the street because it's too dangerous at times. But if you have something that has a trembler switch, um, we used the dogs from the 70s, early 70s on, and they were excellent. If the dog went up, 
sniffed the su suspicious package and turned around and sat down, you knew it was the real thing. Very, very rare that a dog ever make a mistake. I was going to say, how right. accurate was it? Yeah. Yeah. Their, their uh, olfactory capabilities are 200 to 1 compared to a human. Um, That's incredible. There was a lot of hand entry done in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And when so many people were getting hurt, they decided it's time to stop the hand entry. Um, they're not, they waive saving the evidence versus an injury. All right. So we would use a um, water cannon, a water disruptor to shoot a package. But what we would do is we would remotely, using a robot, take an x-ray of the package, examine where the power source was, what type of switch it was, whether we're working with detonators or electric matches, and then we would decide which way we would target. In the uh, early 90s, the Sandy National Laboratories were working on a project uh, called a PAN, P-A-N disruptor, percussion-activated non-electric firing system, which means no one with with blasting caps, you have to be worried about radio frequency and ESD, electric static discharge. So you're walking around in the winter and you get static electricity and you touch something, oh, you get a shock. Well, that ESD will set off an electric cap if you're close proximity or touching it. So those are things you have to be careful about. I was asked and worked on that project for uh, a year or two uh, with the National Laboratories, along with about a dozen other bomb techs from around the country. And New York City got the first uh, prototype. I brought it back from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico on a plane, showed, walked down and showed it to Commissioner Kelly and said this was given to us, explained how it worked. The firing system uses plastic shock tube. Shock tube is much thinner than the tube you use for a fish tank for air. It's about the size of a, just a good piece thick of string. Inside is a coating of PETN and RDX, two high explosives. You use an electric igniter, like a shock gun, to ignite it. Uh, the explosive wave travels through that tube and hits the detonator and functions it. And it travels at over 25,000 feet per second. So once you ignite it, you can just about see it before it causes detonation but it cannot be fired by any outside <clears throat> uh, charge. And that's why it's safe to use in a major metropolitan area where you have cell phones, you have um, TV trucks with uh, high powered antennas and everything else. It made it a lot safer for the bomb attacks. So in New York, you guys would detonate, what would you say the majority was? You would detonate it there or would you use the robot to put it in to bring it somewhere else? I, re I always remember on the news, Saying that the bomb squad would bring uh, would bring it somewhere and they would detonate it. Let's say it. Uh... We were always always remove the main charge from the scene and separate it, hopefully from the power source no and a timing device before we move it on in. Because if you don't, you, there's a possibility with banging around. If the power source is still connected, you could lose your robot. Huh. That is amazing. I like running it to burn a building school. What about you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm out on bombs. I'm out on bombs. I give you as long as you know where the back door of the building is, you'll be all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, usually I tell these guys that I'd rather run towards uh, the sound of gunfire than run towards fire. But uh, I'm this out guy, on bombs. This guy's done it both right here. Yeah, I'm out on bombs. What was the, uh, hold on a minute, Peter. There's a suicide bomber story. Yes, uh, there's a suicide bomber story. I, th I believe you got a citation for that, right, Kev? Yes. Uh, yeah, you want to uh, walk us uh, through that story? Yeah, and and just uh, um, as you tell us the story, uh, MC uh, MC's in the chat. He asked if just tell us to tell us <clears throat> while you're telling the story what Eddie Hayes said to the would-be bomber as you were working on him. But you know, you can build up to that part. Okay. We're working a night duty. It's Eddie Hayes, Charlie Epps, Joe Ayer, and the Sergeant, and myself. <clears throat> it's somewhere about eight, nine o'clock. Um, we hear the SOD radio in our office. Um, 
given a 1013 police officer needs help in the 114 precinct and it was out by um, Ravenswood out where yeah. the Conrad power plant is in Astoria. Yeah, sure. And it says, uh, you know, 1013 um, and he dispatched emergency to the scene. And on the way, he said, uh, be advised, the unit reporting said that the, so the suspect has a bomb or bombs. So with that, we heard it. We got up out to the vehicles and away we went. Uh, Eddie Hayes and uh, Charlie Epps, um, they were uh, driving the truck and I was with Joe Ahern uh, in a station wagon and I was driving and I turned around, went over the Williamsburg Bridge and got up to BQE and I knew exactly where the location was and I got there, I want to say, a minute or two before the other guys did. And when we pulled up, we were quickly briefed that uh, anti-crime cops in the 114 were up in the area, and they were just parked watching different intersections. And they saw a guy roll by in a car by himself. And the guy was turning the heads, looking left and right, and they said, this guy doesn't belong up here. There's nothing here to see, do, or whatever. So they started to follow him. In those days now, you couldn't stop a vehicle unless you had a reason to stop them, some type of traffic violation. Well, he rolled through a stop sign. So they stopped him. And as they walked up to the vehicle, the guy rolls his window down and his, the cop says, can I see your license and registration? They hear banging and yelling from the trunk of the car. Oh, <laughs> shit. The cop draws his weapon on the driver, tells him not to move. He's a second passenger in the car. He complies with the cop's orders. The guy driving the car says to the cop, have a bomb, I'm wired. If I whistle, it'll go off. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, the wind is down. The cop decides that a throat lozenger, like a mag, mini mag flashlight, should work to prevent him from whistling, and puts it in his throat and pulls him through the window of the car onto the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when the 13 goes out again, you know. And this is what we're told. There's six emergency service cops holding guy down, face down, with his arms stretched out. So we walk over and Getting close, I'm on his left side. One of the emergency cops moves over, is holding his arm down. And at this point, he says, I'm going to blow you all up. I'll kill you, whatever. And I said, yeah, OK. And I start cutting his clothes off layer by layer. And the emergency cop says, hey, look at this hand. And down on the wrist, there's a wire coming out of his wrist. We look at the other wrist as a wire. So that's his circuit. Right. Contact circuit, away we go. So I turn around, I start cutting again. And now I find the wires across his shoulders. And he's got a harness strap with a pipe arm under his arm. And he says, don't touch me. Wait for the bomb squad. I said, we are the bomb squad, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to me, where did you get your training? I said, and I don't mean to offend certain culture of people. I said, where are you, from Poland? And he goes, no, Croatia. I said, close oh, enough. Because <laughs> Croatians were very big in the 70s in New York with bombs. Yep. Yeah, Pete. Yep. T.W.A. Pete's Croatian. <laughs> hey, listen, my uncle was jailed for two years for flying right. a flag on, the, uh, yeah, okay. on his house. Well, so right. I get it. Eddie Hayes comes over and giving us a hand. We're cutting his clothes off. We pull a semi-automatic a pistol out of one pocket. Uh, in another pocket, he's got two live grenades. They open the trunk, and there's a Oriental woman in the trunk. <laughs> and we find out, not then, but later on, he had kidnapped her, taken to, her, to an ATM to take money out, and she wouldn't give up the PIN number. He raped her and robbed her, threw her in the trunk, oh, and he was taking God. her up to throw her into the river to drown her. Oh, why was he strapped with the pipe bomb? What was he going to do with that? Because if he was caught, he was going to blow himself up. Oh, God. I'm Croatians, Coops. Oh, it's crazy Croatian, uh, bro. Now it all makes sense to me. 
In the so 70s, what was, so what was the guy? What was the guy saying to him? P, uh, MC said, uh, what, "What was the?" Uh, I don't think his partner could fathom what was going on. I think he was abadabbering, going, "I'm in trouble now." <laughs> he was compliant with all the police orders. So I don't even know if the partner ever knew he had uh, the explosive. No, your partner wasn't your partner saying something to him. What did MC say, Pete? Well, he gave him a few expletives, you know, and. Uh, Few four and five letter words, which is understandable. And, and you're and you're, yeah. not, you're never nervous, like I guess you know. Well, there's always got to be some type of uh, you know. It, there's risk in every job, right? That we, yeah. when we're doing this stuff, like what what are you thinking about, like when you're doing that, like? Well, when we were cutting the wires, I turned around. And I said to Joe Ahern, I there were along the pipe body between the two end caps. He had uh, two AA batteries for his power source, and his wires connected to that. And I started, uh, they're all taped up, and I started tape, untape it with a knife, a scalpel. And uh, most of our cutting was done with scissors we borrowed from EMS because our truck hadn't arrived when we started to cut. Like, uh, trauma, and, like trauma shears or like regular yeah. scissors? Okay, no, gotcha. Yeah, regular fancy hospital scissors. Gotcha. And then I borrowed a scalpel to cut the tape on the batteries. And I said to Joe Ahern, who was holding him down and holding the pipe steady, I said, uh, I want to cut the, uh, I want to cut the positive first. Because two guys in LA a couple months prior to that uh, were working on pipe bombs and uh, they went off and killed both of them. And they thought what happened was that uh, when they cut a wire on the pipe bomb, they cut the negative. The negative wire flew around and possibly touched the pipe bomb, which gave oh. it the circuit. Oh, shit. So we turned around, we cut the positive out first, then took this batteries one at a time off. Once we got those separated, we knew we were safe. So uh, MCs is saying that Eddie said to the would-be terrorist, yeah, uh, I just read the manual. When the guy goes, I hope you knows how. I hope you guys know how to do this. And he said, Yeah, I just read the manual this past weekend. <laughs> we should be good. <laughs> I thought you were looking at me like I was crazy, Pete. I was like, There's a no, no. He story. just said uh. he just said that now, like yeah. three seconds. Kevin, how many has there been any line of duty deaths from the bomb squad in New York? Yes, uh, we have a total of, I think it's six. Is that there right? Was, Giuseppe Petrosini, who was actually in Italy working on the organized crime group called the Black Hand, he was killed in 1903. And then police officers Lynch and Sosha were killed at the World's Fair on July 4th, 1940. And then there was Conley, who was a canine officer responding to a job and uh, was involved in a very serious car crash at the bottom of the East River Drive mm -hmm. and was killed. That was about 70, 72 maybe. Uh, Ryan Murray was killed in 76 and Terry McTeague and five other guys were hurt when they were taken apart a, a Croatian device at the range. <laughs> and uh, Goddamn Croatian. Yeah, you're making a face, Kev, like I got something to do with it. <laughs> you're Croatian, are you? Those are I your am. people. Well, right, listen, man, you know, like what are you I was, with Brian, I was I was with Brian about two weeks before that, and he was working alone at night, and I was in emergency service, and he was in the bomb squad. And uh, he had a, a pipe bomb in the Palladium Theater on 14th Street with five pounds Jesus. of plastic in it. Jesus. And he said to me, he said, will you give me a hand? I said, yeah, what do you need? He said, well, I need you to suit up and you and I will carry it out. And they had the long pole with two hooks with a basket, uh, like a mesh basket of wire. And we put it in there and carried it out and put it in the old LaGuardia carrier. And two weeks later, uh, on 9-11, 76, Brian was killed at the range. Wow. And then we had Danny Richards, who was killed on 9-11. Um, Danny had been in the bomb squad for about 15 years. He was in my team wow. for a while. 
And uh, he had just taken a job as the intel coordinator, which is like the dispatch guy in the office. <clears throat> and on 9-11, I was the first one out the door with Michael Mixon. And it was Mike's first day in the bomb squad responding to jobs. He had just come back from training. He was fully trained. And I, I heard the plane go over. I was talking to somebody at Delta Airlines at LaGuardia at the time. And I said, hang on, I can't hear you, George. And I heard the impact. And then I heard it, the radio light up with you know plane into the Trade Center, huge explosion. Depending upon who was on what side of the Trade Center, we're getting all different reports. So I got up and I said, come on, Mike, we're going. And uh, a female detective in her office turned around and said very calmingly, where are you going? It's just a plane crash. And I went, a plane crash into a high-rise building that's already been the target of a terrorist attack. Do you have a clue? <laughs> no, Al. And that became the saying in the office for the next year. <laughs> well, anyway, Mike and I go out the door, and as I turned, I, I used to moonlight for the airlines. And I used to travel to Europe on my days off and do systems tests on security. So I know the electronic aviation and safeguards that they have. Anti-collision, low altitude, um, all types of cockpit warning devices. I saw the hole in the, 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 the north end of the, the Tower One, and I said to him, I said, Mike, this is no accident. This is going to be a baptism of fire today. And we arrived at 8.55, and I took a shot. I think you guys have a picture of that, of just the North Tower. Yep. Um, after I took that shot, I pulled up and relocated uh, to the corner of Church and VC. And we shut down traffic on VC so that any ambulances coming out of West Street could go right across, come across the East River Drive and get right on uh, at Broadway where it, there's an entrance there by police headquarters. And um, we were there about, say, six minutes. And an engine company and a towel ladder pulled up. And we had the street blocked. And they said, we want to get down church. I moved the truck out of the way. After I got in, I closed it off again. And uh, I would say about six minutes later, uh, the United plane came through. And I could hear the roar. I saw the plane. It went through the building so fast, I could not see the tail markings, meaning what company it said. But it looked like United's colors. With this, the chief of detectives, Bill Ali, pulled up. He had been between the streets with the high rise and looks at the second tower. He says, what happened to the... The, uh, the second tower. I said, it looked like a 767, Chief. It looked like United's colors, but I'm not sure it was going so fast. He said, what's a 767? I said, a big fucking plane. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. And he walked, really back to his, he walked back to his car, and I think he was like car four, and he picked up the radio, and he's called a dispatcher, and he said, notify the Pentagon that we are under attack. And that was 903 and 30 seconds. Wow. He had foresight to do that, and he had the rank to do it too. So, so where, where, uh, how did you escape the collapse then? Where were you at when, when the buildings came down? Well, at about nine twenty, um, no nine nine fifteen, a group of guys from two truck arrived. About ten or twelve, two and three truck together, and they were marching down two guys at a time with medical equipment, uh, belts and ropes, rescue equipment, and that. And I saw two or four of the guys that I knew in person, and I waved hello to him. And I saw one guy, John Delera from Two Truck. And I looked at him. I said, John, how you doing? And he rolled his eyebrows like, I don't know what we're getting into. That was the last time I saw John. He was one of the victims, uh, along with the other nine or plus more emergency service cops. Uh, they went into uh, the tower uh, about 9.20. Kenny Richards showed up from our office along with uh, Brian Hearn and a few other guys. And um, I said to Danny, I said, what are you doing? He's you're supposed to be in the office coordinating things. He said, I wouldn't miss this for the world. Danny had been a peacekeeper in, in uh, the Middle East. Uh, he had been in the presidential honor guard in the uh, airborne division. And uh, an absolutely solid guy. And he said, I wouldn't miss this for the world. And he went one way with a bunch of guys. I went along VC and we went to where the escalators were on the north end of the North Tower. 
one up and one down, and the, the up was still running. So we shut that off so people evacuating could use it as a staircase. Uh, we went up, went onto the plaza floor, and as we were walking across, uh, people were hitting the deck from the North Tower. There were at least, uh, I'd say, six or eight hit the deck when I was walking by. And fortunately, we were about 20 feet out, and they were hitting about eight or 10 feet out. Uh, while I was on the corner prior to that, I saw people jump, and I actually saw a couple jump holding hands. But due to the, the speed of uh, the fall, they were separated. And uh, the, the man, his suit jacket was blown off by the wind on his descent down into the ground. You have to realize how horrific, how hot it was up there. Um, we helped evacuate people at that point and then started to clear the, the plaza and went back down the staircase, back to church in VC. Um, and at that point, um, we have other pictures, Pete, any sense? I'm down Church Street further. I was underneath the, yeah. the South Tower at 958 looking up, and I saw what appeared to be liquid flame. It was actually the jet fuel pouring east as the floor was collapsing. Because as you guys know, the concrete starts to spoil and crack apart at 6, 650 degrees. The floor was giving way. And people say, well, the other tower burned. It was there longer. It was higher. The bearing weight of the 70 floors above is what caused that. To, and the, down first. the weakening in the midpoint, there was more bearing weight on right. the <clears throat> yep. structure that was damaged that caused that to tilt and then give way. I saw it. I realized what was happening. I made a U-turn without stopping and started running down Church Street at, towards whatever this, I forget the name of the street, but I was running from church. Uh, I got half a block before I started to get buried with the dust that was coming down. I tripped over a beam, uh, which causes me a great deal of right pain uh, today still. And uh, as I tell people when I do a presentation on the Trade Center, I ran so fast that I passed two Kenyans who were in New York trying out for the market. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> I mean, so, uh, I saw and, two women opening a door when I was running to a building, like a glass door, and I said, that's my target. I ran there, I got into the door, into the building, and then everything outside went totally black. I found a superintendent inside. There were about 20 people that got into the building that had been watching and ran in there. Um, and I said to him, you're the super? He says, yeah. I said, this basement door, does, if we go to the basement, can we get to the VC Street to get out through the another building out that way? And he said, I don't know. And he said, uh, I don't have a flashlight. I had my car keys in my pocket. I had one of these little LED flashlights where you flip your thumb and there's a light. That's the only light I had. And I went with him into the basement and it was just a dead end. We couldn't get out. We came back upstairs and they had pulled a woman through the door of the place. She was covered from head to toe with dust. She had two inches of dust on her head. She looked like a white ghost. So they started to turn around, take water cups from the water cooler and pour it over, trying to pour the dust off. I said, let's try this. I take the five gallon jug and tell her, close your eyes, close your mouth. And we poured it over the top of her. And what appeared was an elderly black lady. Wow. Who you would not know her color, that she was so covered in this dust and wow. soot. And she was saying, oh, my God, I, I'm alive. I'm alive. I said, yeah, you're alive. Just take it easy. Uh, with this, I heard banging, metal banging against the glass windows or doors. So I went to the door. I opened it up. It was three firemen with their Scott packs on that were, but they were running and crawling and tripping over the debris, the steel. and the. So we pulled them in, and there were only three. And the last guy said, I'm the last guy in the company. I don't know where the rest of them are. So at this point, I'm getting out, and I circle the block to come around back to VC to find my truck. And fortunately, when the 
Second plane came through. I moved it next to the federal building, turned it around, faced it out, and left the windows 90% closed and left it running. And with this, uh, let's see, Manny Lopez, a sergeant for the first deputy commissioner from headquarters, comes running out of number seven. And he sees me, and I'm, I'm dressed in my business suit. And he goes, Kevin, you have a vehicle? I said, yeah. He said, I said, I have to check, see if it's running. It was running when I left it. He said, uh, I got the commissioner. He's on crutches. Can you take him out of here? He said, our car is about a foot and a half high. <laughs> Down on their, their unmarked car. It was a, it, it looked like one of these little uh, box cars, you, you know, that you buy for the kids. And I said, yeah. So I go over and I said, yeah, my, my truck's running. Open the door. Brian Hearn now is with me. He jumps in the seat and back doors are open. We have a shield, metal graded shield between the equipment and us. We got a robot back there. We have, we have explosives. We have x-ray equipment. We have bomb suits, a lot of heavy stuff. So with this, the uh, guys are climbing in the back of the truck. The, the chauffeur, the sergeant opens the door and there's the commissioner and Brian Hearn looks like this. He goes, oh, now he'd relieved Michael Mixon. One of the sergeants took him because he was new and gave me a, a senior guy you know, at the scene to change our capabilities. So with this, he jumps out. He gets in the back. Brian gets in the back and the commissioner gets in the front with his crutches. They close the doors. And with this, somebody in the back is banging on the grating. And I'm looking in the rear view, then I'm looking in the side view. I look in the right hand mirror in the convex, and I look and I see the tower, the North Tower coming down behind me. And as I'm pulling away, it's still cloudy down and you can't see anything. I'm hitting the siren and I'm just cruising real slow down, telling people walking, I tell them, get to a side street now. Get out of the main road, get to a side street, because this this cloud's gonna come down again. And Commissioner Dunn says, Kevin, take it easy. Don't run anybody over. I said, Commissioner, I'm not going to run anybody over. Don't worry about it. There's enough stuff going on today as it is. So as I turn from chambers to, no, from church to chambers to take him to police headquarters, everything blows by behind me. Just missed us. So I drive over to police headquarters, drop everybody off, and go back to the scene. I can't get where I was, I have to park my car right off of Broadway and I walk in and then we start looking for people. Uh, we went in, prior to the collapse of the buildings, we went into number five uh, and they had a preschool there and they, they had emptied so fast that the teacher had left a pocketbook there. So I had taken it out with a valuable and put it in our truck when it was parked and sometime after the second tower collapse, we got pulled off to go to another assignment out in Queens. On the way back, we had to stop at the precinct, the first precinct, to drop it off to be vouchered so they could call the woman. In the meantime, the desk office is telling me, you're going to have to wait because I have my clerical man is tied up with injuries. So I turned around and I said to him, hold on one second. I called down operations. I said to the guy in operations, uh, you can tell him you talk over the chief of department. Would you tell him we don't wait? <laughs> I said, we have a backlog. And, you know, it was funny at the time, but, you know, see how silly you could be yeah. with your clericals. What, but, what, uh, what, what, what was the sound like? I know what it looked like, but what was that sound like as it was coming down? Deafening. Deafening. The steel, the two-inch steel in the World Trade Center, and those are on the lower floors, weighs 900 pounds a foot. Wow. And it was just just the sound and everything else. The ground shook like an earthquake. And then we lost all power. We lost, you know, uh, we still had radio communications. We were lucky. Did wow. you know John, uh, the, the Vigia's uh, son? Vigiano. John Vigiano. Vigiano. Yeah, I knew, I knew Vigiano, yes. Yeah. There was, the he was in three truck. But uh, well, I was out of there a long time already. Wow. My old lady was one of those people running from the 
running from the scene because she went to school right there at mm. Pace. And mm -hmm. she got out of the train right when the uh, second plane hit. And yeah. uh, I guess they all had hung around until the first building fell. And she was one of those people covered in dust that ran, 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 ran. There's a Crazy. picture that I gave you, and it shows the intersection, the church in VC, yeah. uh, basically looking towards the uh, southwest. And you can see a cop on the corner, right? And he's trying to control any emergency traffic. But you can see in the background the people, how calmly they are leaving prior to the collapse. Right. Wow. Right. Right, they just thought it, it was. They thought it was just another crazy day in New York, probably. Right, no one thought the buildings were going to collapse at that point. Well, at nine twenty, I said to the chief of detectives, "I don't know how long it's going to take." I said, "But this reminds me of the years ago when they had the huge pier fires." I said, "They could pour all the water they wanted on, but what happens is it would burn, and then the pier would collapse and fold into the river." I said, "These buildings are going to come down." I said, "I don't know if it'll be today, tomorrow, whatever." Didn't expect it in 58 minutes, though. Wow. Yeah. Well, the jet fuel's burning at about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, like 2,200 Celsius, right? So that had to have accelerated things, no? Yes. Yeah, super hot. And then the as the higher you went, the thinner the concrete on the floors were. Mm. Uh, the Port Authority, if you were bringing in a heavy piece of equipment like a safe, you had to get permission from them depending upon how high your floor was. Right. What's that picture below that? Is a helicopter? What is that? What's that from? Uh, well, that's another thing we could talk about in a minute. Yeah. But we're well, just getting to 9-11 here. Brief, brief follow-up. 17 years later, I go to the Wantour Inn for an emergency service reunion on Long Island. And I am walk in. I sign the sheet. And I say to oh, one or two guys I see. And I see all these young guys. And I'm looking now. I'm going, you know. It, it's uh, 30 years since I was in emergency, you know, and I see one old time. I say hello. And with this, I go back to the sign in sheet and I said, where's all the old timers? He said, oh, there'll be it. will be it. With this, a young guy walks in and he says to them, he said, I'm so-and-so from Nassau County Emergency Service. He said, I was told I could come. He says to the guy, sign in. And I said, oh, welcome. How you doing? He said, well, he said, this is my brother. He's a uh, deputy chief in the fire department in New York. And I turned to him and I said, you brought your brother to an emergency service party who's a fireman? You trying to get him killed? <laughs> and the brother looks at me like, what? He says, well, he's, he said, he said, well, yeah, he, I thought it'd be, I said, sure, it's all right. I'm only kidding. And he says, my name is Sheehan. And he says, he says, Daniel Sheehan, a deputy chief. I said, how do you do? He's in counterterrorism bureau. I said, okay, great. I introduced myself. He said, uh, he said I was in the city uh, on 9-11. I was a city cop then. I said, really? What are we doing? He said, I was Joe Dunn's driver. He really? was the commission's driver to come out on crutches. Oh, I said, shit. really? And he goes, yeah. I said, what were you doing then? He said, well, I was with the commissioner. And he says, when the building collapsed, our car was crushed. And as we went out, we got in the back of a truck. Your I said, truck. Yeah. He and the commissioner got in the front. I said, yeah. I said, was that the bomb squad truck you were in? He goes, yeah, I think it was. I said, and you drove away. The tower collapsed behind you, and you went on Chambers Street to headquarters. You got out. He goes, yeah, how do you know? I said, I was driving that truck. No shit. Said, You're kidding me. He says, no. That's a pretty good he said, I didn't know that. I said, I didn't know you were in the back. He <laughs> says, you saved now he's telling his brother, I saved his life. I said, listen, take it easy. I didn't save your life. <laughs> Take it easy. I, said, I didn't save your life, but I had fifteen dollars on the meat, and you didn't pay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Is so, that the Danny Sheehan we know, bro? Yeah, yeah, that's probably the same one. Interesting so stuff. Before we uh, before we move on to the old school tip of the day, let's talk about uh, the aviation unit here. Um, since you sent the photos, and you could probably yes, explain this. That's a, a rescue, a man in the water in the East River in the middle of February, and the helicopter, the jet, jet ranger came up, uh, flew in and dropped that white ball, which is an inflatable uh, tubular uh, <clears throat> raft for him to hold on to. And when the helicopter was there, 
the guy wouldn't take it. And then he was trying to kill himself. He was about 80 something years old. Oh God. I shouldn't say that now. Cause I'm getting there, you know, myself, <laughs> but uh, the helicopter dropped it. And uh, at that point they didn't land those helicopters in the water to make a rescue. And we didn't have the dive teams that they had. So oh, yeah, look at how old on the right there and Joe Ahern, uh, both in emergency service at the time, both later in the bomb squad together. We went in after him and uh, with a life ring and a K-Pox and brought him out and he survived. How did you guys rappel down or you guys are jumping down into the water at that time? What, what are they? We, uh, we, uh, we used a three quarter inch line with leather gloves. Prior to that, uh, when all the rope was condemned, uh, with the problem with the rot that they were in the storehouses, I had to use a nylon rope one time and I lost all the flesh on both hands. Took me a while. Yeah, yeah, to get go back. back. Yeah. I had Holy second shit. and third degree burns on both hands from the nylon rope. Jeez. Yeah, and screw let that. me tell you, the salt water on the burns hurts. Woo! Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> I don't know how you guys jump in that water, man. Yeah. Uh, quick question from the chat. Uh, MC's in the chat is asking about your fondest memories of Dan Richards. And who is Dan Richards? Dan Richards was a one of the guys on my team, um, a good friend and a great asset to the bomb squad. Um Dan and I actually ran into each other. My wife, my, my wife and I were in Hawaii. Uh, we were there on our 25th anniversary. And he found out I was going. And he said, I'm going to be there at the same time. And I said, well, when you get there, give me a shout and uh, come on over. I said, my wife and I will be celebrating. We've got a couple of bottles of Clicquot champagne. And he said, Clicquot? I said, yeah, my wife is French. And that she loves that. He said, oh, that, that's my favorite, too. I said, well, Dan, you obviously have expensive tastes. So uh, he showed up. We drank a couple of uh, bottles of champagne. I don't know how we made it back to his hotel. Fortunately, I was in mine. But uh, uh, Danny showed up on 9-11, uh, and it cost him his life. He was trying to do what everybody else in police and fire and rescue services were trying to do to help other human beings. Amen. Yep. So I just want to point out, Rufi, uh, he seems like a very humble man, but this man that we're speaking to uh, has been honored with the following New York City Police Department Award, six excellent police duty medals, 10 meritorious police service medals, eight commendations medals for acting for acts involved great risk of personal injury, the New York City Police Medal for Merit, and the TWA number 800 investigation medal. So... You had an unbelievable career, and the city is in debt to you, Mr. Barry. Thank you for your service. Unbelievable career. Yeah, man. It was a it was a great time. I enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, you know what? Uh, I never really had a dispute with any of the firemen because I knew what the job they were doing. And I basically turned around and introduced myself on the scene and say, hey, listen, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. Can you do this for us? It would be helpful. And once you said that to them, there was no animosity at all. Yeah, maybe it was fight over territory or jobs and stuff like that. But we didn't, you know, we didn't have time for that. We we're too busy. <laughs> ah, I like that. Like that. Ah. You guys can have this over here. We're gonna go over there. Yeah, yeah. Listen, we gotta go save some more lives. You, uh, what do you yeah. want? You want to do this elevator here? That's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I work with guys, uh, and we had a man under a train. And the first units there, they're under the train, and it's a crowded platform. And we pull up, and we bring down a body bag, and we bring down portal lights, and. They're underneath, and I go between the cars, and, and I say to them, do you guys need a hand? And with this, one guy says, Ray Buckowitz says, no. And he flings a this hand guy's up. arm, yeah. arm and hand. <laughs> that one. I knew there you were going to say that. We I don't need it. Said. And with this, Oof. you got the now you have the passengers on the subway platform who are gawking this thing, throwing up all over the place. Those ah, that's messy. humor. That's always yeah. messy. Those things. Yeah, not a big fan. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think who's gonna. I know who's gonna win a salty for the best dressed guest we've ever had. Oh, the best dressed. There's no way he's gonna. 
He could put the salty right up there with all that other stuff. He's well, got there's, right there. there's these awards. We do an award show every year, and then there's these awards called the Salties. You're probably going to be getting one for best dress. <laughs> let, me, let me give you a family story real quick. Go, Go for it. Uh, about a year or two ago, uh, my grand, the youngest granddaughter goes to school, and the teacher says, it's Christmas time. Does anybody have a Christmas story that's funny? And she turns around, and she says, yeah, my pop, he climbed a Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center because it was a crazy man in a tree. No shit. <laughs> and right. the teacher turns around and she says, listen, Keely, that's not good. We don't want to hear fake news. Oh. <laughs> you know, and she starts to cry. So she goes home and tells her mother, my daughter. So then I have to dig out the articles from the paper. And it was in the <laughs> Times. It was this paper. It was pictures. It was this, this lunatic at 2 o'clock in the morning turned around and climbed the Christmas tree in Rock Center. And if you've ever had a close-up of the tree, that tree is 40% artificial because they wire more branches and it'll make it look good, along with the lights, right? Ah, this guy's up, know that. He's up about 60, 65 feet. So it's 2 in the morning. There's Ray Buckowitz, Frank Borowski, and Joe. Another, can't remember the last name. We arrive at the scene and we have the truck, the big truck, four of us. Um, the first thing I do is I get out, I get a belt and I get some rope and I start climbing with Buckowitz. And we're up about a third of the way. And first the, the security guy from Rock Center comes running out and comes, no, no, you can't go up, can't go up. I said, listen, we have to go up. <clears throat> so we go up and... As we're climbing up, I hear a chainsaw start, start up, a gas chainsaw. And I look down, and here's Pawarski, a Polsky boy. He's, he started the chainsaw, and he's swinging it around so that the guy in the tree can see it. And the Rockefeller Center guy goes, no, no, you can't cut the tree down. And he said, excuse me, sir, this is a psychological boy. Would you step up and let us do our job? I thought he'd probably try to scare the guy, thinking he's going now, to take a head. We get up to the guy and we said, hey, listen, we're, we're now at, down by his ankles. I said, listen, it's time to come down from the tree. It's the middle of the night. We're tired. You're tired. Let's go. and we'll get. Maybe we'll get a cold beer or a drink and something. You know, we can talk about this. And the guy goes, don't you remember me? So I look and I go, no, I really don't recognize your shoes. No. <laughs> and he goes, I was on a water tower in Brooklyn three days ago. Oh, shit. So I said, oh, I remember that. Oh. Yeah. I said, but that's a trucks area. That's not ours. We're a different unit. So we don't know you. So this is now a fresh start. You can come down easy. You're going to come down hard because we will mace you. And when you slide, you're going to hit every branch on the way down, along with all those nice Christmas lights and bowls, and they're going to hurt you. Guy, all right, all right, I'll come down, I'll come down. I'm like, so, guy comes down, that's it. But my granddaughter took all the stuff to school the next day with all the proof, and the teacher had to embarrass and had to apologize in front of the class. Well, at least she at least she apologized, right? Good for her. Yeah. Well, in today's day and age, with what's going on in the schools, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah. if they're woke or not awake. <laughs> Both. <laughs> oh, yeah. Petey's getting it up. Oh, uh, don't give it to him. Both. All right. All right. I think it is that time. Okay, it's time for, ladies and gentlemen, for the old school tip. Of the day, 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 NYPD style. Take it away, uh, detective. If you're not sure, sound a second alarm. <laughs> that's it. And, and never, never do anything that's going to put you on the front page of the daily news so that your family is embarrassed. Nice. Oh, I like what, it. What did Simple. you say earlier, Kevin? You said something I like. You said... Something about risk or chance. How, how did you word that before? You, you take risks, but you don't take chances. Yeah, that's I right. like that. A risk is you evaluate. Calculated risk. You right. make a, a good decision on the best way to approach a situation without being injured. A chance taker just says, let's just run in there and start yeah, shooting. Yeah, without thinking about anything, right? 
And remember, oh, just give a second alum. I think keep your powder out. dry. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> keep your powder dry. That's it. That's hey. Classic. And if you hear anybody from the bomb squad on the scene yell fire in the hole, make sure you got covered. <laughs> yeah. Breathe, I thoroughly breathe out. Enjoyed your show, Mr. Barry. Thank you, Detective. Yeah, nice great. job. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for your years of service and your professionalism. Stay safe. And may all your brothers stay safe. Thank you very much. Pete, what do you got? You have any shout outs, Pete? No shout outs tonight, just our usual uh, thing. Do you guys have any shout outs? Uh, Detective, no, do you have any shout outs? I do not. No. Just if the, uh, the guy that took the ride with me on 9 11 remembers, he still owes me the 15 bucks. Get the money <laughs> off him. Get that <laughs> money off him. Get it. Get that cash. Okay. Well, very quickly, just hang in with us, Detective, real quick. We're going to just go through our spiel, and then we'll end the show, and we'll say our goodbyes afterwards. But you guys all know the deal. We're on every player. If you want to listen to the show instead of watching, uh, listen on uh, iTunes Podcast, Spotify, wherever, however. Also, if you're here at YouTube.com forward slash Getting Salty Experience, hit that like, subscribe, and share button. It helps us out. It's free. Hit the button. It pumps us up the charts okay uh if you're on instagram find us at salty dog inc if you want to buy our wares hit us up at getting salty apparel thank you to everyone in the super chat uh a special shout out from me actually to loot seven in the super chat i can't like you know if anybody in the super chat is uh is a super fan it's loot seven so uh thank you brother uh anyone in the super thanks thank you in advance we appreciate that Facebook guys, getting salty fans. That's where you find forty thousand plus members. I think like up to forty five or more now. Six, seven. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot. Forty six, forty seven thousand maniacs just like you guys watching, listening, talking, sharing. It's a, it's a global firewire, if you will. So check it out. Uh, want to eat? Want to advertise with us? Getting salty ads ads at gmail.com. Uh, I will shoot you this the spiel. We give everyone getting salty experience at gmail.com for all your questions. Um, and Coop's podcast at gmail.com for all the content that you guys would like to see on our news shows. So helmet camp footage, fire photos, uh, pictures of the rig, pictures of uh, your mustache or uh, tattoos. And don't forget the ever popular and uh, still growing hot old lady contest to be won right. by Rob Procaccini's wife, probably again, uh, Mrs. Procaccini, because you guys are not you're, not, you're not sending them in, in, in enough. But hot old lady contest, uh, Coop's podcast at gmail.com. And that is all the news that is fit to print. Excellent. Thank you, Detective Barry. Appreciate your service. Like I said, appreciate you coming on. You're a gentleman, and uh, what a great career. And the city is very lucky to have had you. Thank you, Absolutely. Great Absolutely. career, brother. Great career. All right, fellas, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we say, stay low and go. All right, everyone. We'll see you at the big one. All right. Cheers, everybody.